This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financiers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. Hi, I'm Russ Capper, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. Today, we're talking storage for the grid, and our guest is Dr. Donald Sadaway, Professor of Materials Chemistry at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he's going to share details with us about his liquid metal battery. This is the potential game changer that has attracted investment from Bill Gates and Vinod Khosla. All of that after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? from natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source. At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Makers Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Makers Show. Welcome back to the Energy Makers Show. My guest now is Don Sadaway, the professor of materials chemistry at MIT. Uh, Dr. Sadaway, welcome to the Energy Makers Show. Thanks, Chris. You bet. Well, uh, you've had a lot of success at MIT, but what you're most known for today is the liquid metal battery. Give us an overview of this particular technology. So the liquid metal battery is a technology that I invented specifically for grid level storage. This is not going to help us with uh, cars, it's not going to help us with cell phones or laptops. It's strictly for stationary storage. Um, and the issue there is cost. And so I invented the liquid metal battery right from the beginning with cost in mind. And so it's made of earth abundant elements found in the United States, and it's easy to assemble. We can assemble this thing in open air. Um, we don't need any fancy clean rooms, atmosphere, stuff like that. And so the concept behind the liquid metal battery, as the name implies, uh, the electrodes are uh, liquid metal, and then uh, between the electrodes you need a layer of electrolyte, um, and that electrolyte is a, uh, instead of a salt solution in water, it's a salt that's uh, melted. So this operates at elevated temperature. And the three layers float one on top of the other because the, the liquid metal is insoluble in the molten salt and the molten salt is insoluble in the liquid metal. So we put a, a low density metal on the top and that acts as the negative electrode and we put a high density liquid metal on the bottom and that acts as a positive electrode. And if you connect those two electrodes to a, a load or an appliance in the external circuit, uh, you'll draw current from this thing. Okay, well I know that grid level storage has been a, a desire for quite some time, particularly as all the alternative energy has really taken off. W were you aiming at that from the beginning? Yes, uh, I think one of the unmet needs of uh, the uh, renewables such as uh, wind right. and solar is the, their intermittency. Right. Um, we, we, as Americans, we'd like to draw electricity on demand, and so that means that we need to figure out a way to draw electricity from the sun even when the sun doesn't shine. Right. Um, and there are batteries out there right now, and people are using some of them, but they're in reality far, far too costly for this application if we're going to see widespread deployment. So my goal was to invent a battery technology that could work, but also uh, hit the price point. And then, uh, as I got into it, I realized that there are uh, many, many uses for energy storage in the conventional grid. And um, so th this battery is, is proving to be a, a boon to not just the renewables, but also to, to make today's grid more reliable, reduce the wide price swings, and to reduce the cost of the rate payer. I mean, right now we've got about 30% excess capacity that's sitting there for less than 1% of the time when we go to this super high uh, demand. And the rest of the time that stuff just sitting there. Name me another industry where you have 30% excess capacity doing, and that's not how you run an airline, 30% right. of your plane sitting right. on the ground uh, 362 right. days a year. Right. But that's what we do in our, in our uh, grid. Right. So with a cost-effective battery, we could um, stabilize our grid, make it less prone to uh, 
blackouts. There's a whole host of benefits. Right. Well, we, we've heard, we've had several guests on the show that talk about this demand response initiative, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting, but it's basically cutting back your service in order to handle those peak loads. But yours sounds much, much more interesting. W what are some of the samples of, of conventional grid application that you've thought of along the way? So uh, there are certain places uh, in the United States, uh, Manhattan is one of them. Uh, there are some places in the Midwest where there is abundant generating capacity, mm -hmm. but it's located outside the city. Mm -hmm. Uh, outside, uh, far from what they call the demand centers. Right. Uh, and the way you get the electricity from the generating facility to uh, the site of the demand is by transmission lines. Right. Well, in, in these locations, the capacity of the transmission lines is pretty much maxed out. And so there are days where the demand is high, the electricity is available, but it's though, you know, you're trying to put out a fire and you got a little garden hose okay. instead of a fire hose. Okay. So you might say, well, why don't you just go and install more capacity? Well, you got to get permitted right. and you, you go into a public setting. Uh, people are afraid. They think that their kids are going to get, uh, they're going to be mutated from the electromagnetic <laughs> right. fields right. and so on and so forth. <laughs> right. And so with these batteries, you could use the existing transmission line infrastructure and send the electricity to the demand centers in the wee hours of the morning when the overall electricity flow is not right. congested. And then in the middle of the day, you just call it out of the basement or call it from right. the, 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 the building where the batteries are. So that's one example, but there are others. Uh, um, you know, the electricity that's powering the devices during this interview was generated just seconds ago. Right. Um, if all of a sudden there's a, a big spike in, in demand or there's a big drop in demand, we've got to immediately decrease the supply. Right. And that can take 10, 15 minutes. So during that time, the grid gets a little bit unstable. One of the things that happens is that the frequency changes. Now, all of our devices are calibrated for 60 hertz, 60 cycles per second. And that's plus or minus a fraction of a percent. If that demand supply situation gets out of whack, one of the things that can happen is that the frequency starts to change and all of our electronic devices are going to go haywire. So again, a battery could respond in a millisecond and guard, protect the stability of the grid. So those are two examples of a of conventional grid right now. And there's, if you, if you look, there's a, 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 an organization called the Electricity Storage Association. I think they specify 17 different values for storage on today's conventional right. grid. Now, let, let's get more specific. It's called liquid metal right. battery. Uh, you said the metal is in abundance. Right. What metals are we talking about? Well, at MIT, we've been at this for about uh, five, six years now. And uh, so there's a, there's a plurality of chemistries, but I'll give you an example of mm -hmm. one of them. So uh, one of the first ones that we worked with uh, used uh, uh, magnesium as the metal for the upper electrode. As, as people know, magnesium is a light metal. Right. Um, it's low density. And um, so, and, and magnesium is found in the United States. It's also found in seawater. And in fact, at one point, the largest magnesium smelter on the planet was in Freeport, Texas. Okay. And the supply of magnesium was a pipe into the Gulf of Mexico. Because if you t go out in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and you draw a cube, measuring one kilometer on edge. Right. That contains in the seawater, as a dissolved magnesium salt, enough magnesium salt to make one million tons of magnesium, okay. which is more than is the output of all of the magnesium smelters in the world for a full year. So we got plenty of we magnesium. We have an abundance. Right? We got enough of that. Okay. Um, now on the bottom electrode, we're using a variety of, of, of metals. Um, uh, some of the candidates include things like lead and antimony, and those are also found in the United States and also found in neighboring countries like Mexico and Canada. So we don't have a supply chain that extends to Africa, as is the case with cobalt, or to China, as is the case with lithium. I'm curious. I mean, you make it sound so basic. Why hasn't it been done before, and what inspired you? What triggered the idea in your mind? So what triggered the idea was um, I wanted to address this problem uh, from a cost standpoint, and I reasoned that the classical approach to battery research, which uh, looks at things that are something like a flashlight battery, you know, a right circular cylinder about the size of a, a soda can, scaling that up to grid level 
uh, has been proven to be uh, not successful and, and hitting the price point. So I decided, well, why don't I look for inspiration outside the uh, energy storage arena? And uh, my other work at MIT has been in uh, electrochemical production of metals, how you make magnesium, aluminum, titanium, and these are all made by the action of electric current. So an aluminum smelter consumes huge amounts of electric current. So I was looking at the schematic of an aluminum smelter saying, boy, this thing really knows how to chow down electricity. Is there a way to figure out how to store that electricity and then make it available on demand? So in other words, take an electricity sink and turn it into an electricity source. So that was the inspiration for it. And um, we know that that smelter is really efficient because you make virgin metal for less than 50 cents a pound. Okay. And I figured that's, that's a modern economic miracle. Is there some way that I could take the lessons that I've learned from studying the production of magnesium and apply them to uh, storage, but stationary storage, right. about cars, right. remember? Now, as far as why has nobody else done this before, it's, it's always hard to, to explain non-existence, right. but I, at, at one level, you know, until recently, the whole concept of grid-level storage was uh, uh, foreign because uh, if you, you remember back in the 60s when nuclear power was, was starting to proliferate, there was that expression, too cheap to meter. The, the, the notion that we might need to guard against transmission line congestion, uh, off-peak shifting, didn't exist. it didn't exist. Right. So that, you know, in many instances, invention is a technological solution to a technological problem. And there were some people that actually dabbled on the edges of this and looked at systems like lithium with selenium and things like that. They were very expensive, but they, they started to get to the, the point of liquid metal battery, but they immediately started to, the, the researchers tried to convert that technology into something that could go on a car because electric vehicles had been a dream going back to the 60s, but not grid-level storage. So right. maybe I'm just in the right place at the right time, <laughs> and, you know, that's it. Well, don't be so modest, but, uh, but do share with us. What's, what's the status today of the technology? I mean, I know you're, you're taking it forward to commercialize it, correct? That's right. Uh, two years ago, uh, I figured I'd been uh, far enough along with the research that the risk was low enough, there's still lots of risk, sure. so don't, don't misunderstand me, but I figured that the risk was low enough, I might be able to justify accelerating the race to scale up. So you remember, I, at, at the university, it's all basic research, we, right. we work with tiny laboratory replicas of this technology, but there's a whole set of unknowns associated with, will this thing scale? Is right. my hunch right? right. Is, is, is the lesson, are the lessons that I've learned from looking at aluminum smelting, are they gonna give me that technology at scale really cheap? Well, the only way to find out is to build the thing okay. at scale. And y you get to a certain size where it's too big to be uh, done at, uh, on a right. university campus. So I started a company and um, got uh, initial funding, now have uh, two years behind me and uh, that company is employing 22 people, a number of PhDs, some of them my former students, and a boatload of engineers. And we're racing to solve the scale-up problems, and we hope to have a, a commercial size prototype by um, early 2014. Cool. Now, I understand you say you got funding. I understand there's some government ARPA money that came in, as well as some Bill Gates money. That's right. So uh, just to be clear, the company has no government funding. The company okay. is all private funding. Okay. Um, and you're right. My first investor was Bill Gates personally. Okay. Uh, I met him. Uh, because he'd been uh, watching my chemistry lectures on the internet, okay. um, eventually watched all 35 of them, and uh, then said he wanted to meet me and came to Boston. We chatted for about 90 minutes in my office one day, and it, we did talk, among other things, about storage, and, and I told him about my ideas on liquid metal battery, and he said, you know, if you ever decide to spin this out as a company, let me know. I might be willing to put some money into it. And about a year later, I approached him, and he he, he became my first investor. Cool. Uh, the other the other the other money comes from uh, the French energy company Total. Okay. And uh, with our Series B, we have uh, money from a, a California-based venture capital firm, Kosla Ventures. Oh yeah. And Vinod Vinod, Vinod yeah, Kosla yeah, and yeah, Bill Gates right. are buddies, and right. you know it's it's all good. It's patient yeah. money. People that 
understand the yeah. the higher purpose and are are going to are going to back us over the long haul. Um, now on campus, on campus, that's uh, government money from okay. the Department of Energy right. that's supporting the basic research. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be a recipient of a first round ARPA E okay. uh, grant, and uh, that's I've had that for for almost three years now, and it's it's running to a close at the end of this calendar year. And I also have some industrial funding from uh, Total. Total was actually the first major investor on the basic research on campus. So there's really two separate Total grants. Wow. With the timing you mentioned, I mean, we could expect as consumers to perhaps experience it as early as 2015 if everything went smoothly? Well, I sure hope so, but okay. I, you know, I, I, I don't want to raise expectations. I'll, I'll be happy if we are able to get uh, industrial scale prototypes in the hand of a third party because you know I, something as uh, important as grid level storage needs to be uh, thoroughly verified before right. we start putting this stuff on the grid and um, you can't you can't rely on on the inventor right. you need to have independent verification so if 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 we hit that milestone that we get that uh, initial industrial prototype out by uh, uh, say early to mid 2014, uh, it depends on resources. If if a boatload of money comes in after that and we can accelerate the scale up, maybe we'll have something by 2015. But I think it's it's premature for me to forecast at this point. Okay. Well, I'm sure our audience is really appreciative, uh, as I am, of you giving us some time and telling us your story. That's my pleasure, Russ. You bet. That's Dr. Don Sadaway of MIT. And that wraps up this episode of the Energy Makers Show, heard on the radio nationwide and seen at theenergymakers.com. 